Hi, this is Aboki, and today I want to talk about reading and writing as a grad student. So my experience is very much centered around being a PhD student in an engineering field. So given how many different types of grad school programs there are out there, I don't know how generalizable what I'm talking about will be, uh, but I hope it should be broadly applicable enough that really anyone who is studying or working in a field that requires a lot of communication might be able to relate to it or have uh, different takes on what I'm talking about. So people always say that the best way to get better at writing is to read a lot and write a lot. And what I want to do is lay out some of the specific examples of how reading and writing for fun have actually made me better um, as a scientist and as a student over the past few years. I'm going to be splitting this into two videos. So today I'm going to be talking about reading for fun. And the next video, which I'll put out within the next week, um, will be focused on how writing for fun has helped me. I'm now in my fifth year of my PhD where I'm studying biomedical engineering. And I think that now that I've gone through five years of this PhD, hopefully not too much more, um, I've gathered some data on how um, how this whole grad school thing goes. So I'm kind of now at this point where I like think back and process on what it's been like, mostly to avoid thinking about how I may never leave. Uh, so I think when you're a PhD student, it's really easy to get into this mentality that all of your time should be dedicated to your research. Um, basically, you should spend as much time as possible as you can in lab, and the time that you're not spending in lab, you should be thinking about your research. And if you're not thinking about research, you're probably wasting your time. And I think the thought process is really the product of a lot of the insecurity that comes from being a grad school student. And some of it is really just based on what you might like about your own work. If you're working on something that you're really into, you might think that you have to spend all of your time on it to really maximize how exciting it is. When you get stuck in this kind of thought process, it becomes very easy to think of the things that you do for fun, like any of your hobbies. It's easy to start thinking of those things as distractions. And the moment they become distractions, you want to start to cut them out of your life. And for me, one of the easiest things to cut out is reading. I think this is true for a lot of people who get into some kind of work or some kind of activity that starts to take up a lot of their time. Um, even if they really love reading, reading often becomes the thing that's first to go. And I think it's just because it takes so much focus. It takes a lot of time and energy to think about what you're going to read and then to invest the time to read it. So something like watching TV or listening to music or podcasts, those are things you can do when you know you're cleaning the house, when you're falling half asleep. You can do them when you're not completely focused, but it's very hard to read and do anything else at the same time. And so I think when you're finding yourself crunched for time, books are one of the first things to go. So actually for me during grad school, one of the first things that got me back into reading for fun were comic books. So this was sometime during my second or third year. I think a lot of it was that there were all of these superhero movies coming out. Marvel was starting to have more diverse comic books, so in particular Miss Mar Marvel made me really interested in reading comic books because it was the first time that there was going to be this like major brown girl superhero. So reading a few of these comics started getting me to learn more about other comics and that kind of built more and more into a weekly habit of comic book reading thanks to things like the Comixology app and my local comic book store. In the past few years my comic book reading has act has gone down. A lot of it is that for me following a story from issue to issue having that la wait time between those issues is, is hard. I have a hard time remembering what happened and so it makes it hard for me to get invested in the story. A lot of times I'll actually wait for the trade issues and that makes it easier for me to kind of process the story overall. A lot of times when you think of the reading that's supposed to be that's supposed to make us better as writers, I think what people are thinking of is things like uh, literary fiction, really good nonfiction, beautiful essays, maybe even poetry. Um, but comic books are not always given the same due. And for me, I've realized that comic books have actually had a huge impact on something that a lot of us really suck at, which is PowerPoint presentations. PowerPoint presentations are one of those things that regardless of the field you're in are just can be so terrible. I mean, I think we've all sat through a terrible PowerPoint presentation at some point. Maybe it's a talk that had a lot of text on one slide followed by a million pictures on the next with no context and maybe a lot of colors that are really distracting, things that don't get explained. 
we've all made those presentations and we've all sat through those presentations. And it's hard because unless you have someone who's really willing to give you the critique on how to improve your presentation, a lot of the times all we know is don't put too much text on and make your font size big. And those are great, but they're not necessarily specific. But comics are such a good way to learn about PowerPoint presentation, especially for finding that balance between visual and text, because that's really all they are. So things like color choices and ratio of text to image and how to draw your, your audience's attention to a particular message, those are things that comic book writers and artists are thinking about all the time. And I think if you start to approach your, like your PowerPoint presentation or any similar kind of presentation as a comic book that's supplementing your vocalized message, it can really help to narrow down what should go in your slides and how it should be laid out. This is still definitely a work in progress for me and it probably always will be, but I think these principles um, applied to PowerPoint presentations as well as poster presentations um, can really help you to edit down what you display and hopefully make your point stronger. The other kind of non-book form of reading that I started doing really just for fun, um, didn't really have anything to do with my research, but that I think has actually helped me overall is reading these blogs written by Janet Reed, the literary agent. She writes two blogs. One is Query Shark, which is a blog where hopeful writers um, submit draft queries uh, about their work um, to poten potential agents. Um, the other is a blog that is more about kind of the ins and outs of the publishing industry. Um, so I will link to these two blogs below. And these are two blogs that on the surface don't really have that much to do with what I'm working on. I'm not a writer trying to get her first novel published. Somehow I found the Query Shark blog and I just got really sucked into reading it. And what I've realized over the course of reading it is that this blog is actually one of the best ways to learn about how to edit your any writing that you're doing about your work. These queries are basically something that scientists have to do all the time, which is they need to be able to sell their work to an audience that doesn't necessarily have to care about it. And these queries aren't very long either, so a lot of what her comments are getting at are how to boil down your story to its bare essentials, as well as how to use your limited word space to entice an audience to actually acknowledge your work. And I think this is especially important for grad students because I think a lot of the time, those of us who are science grad students, we think that to be able to get people to value our research the way that we do, they need to know every single detail of what we've been doing. Like they need to know every successful experiment, every failed experiment, every single thing we've thought about. They need to know everything. At least that's what I think a lot of us think when we go into um, talking or writing about our research. But the fact is that no one is going to value our research the way we do. Maybe our advisors do, but even then, they're not the one working on this project day in and day out. No one is going to love your research the way that you do because they're not the ones doing it. So they don't need to know every single experiment you're doing and everything that's worked and not worked to know how much work you're doing. What they need is a good pitch, and that's basically what these queries are. They're writers taking something that they really love and boiling it down to the bare essentials. So a lot of what her comments are are about how to get to the core of your message quickly, and with the limited word space you have, how to entice an audience that has no reason to care about your work. And in the end, you can't really get better criticism than from someone who's reading pitches from people who want to be writers. Like, even if they're making mistakes, their mistakes are the best to learn from. But these are some examples of kind of less obvious reading materials, but I did want to talk about one book that made a huge difference um, for me during grad school. Uh, so it actually almost feels too obvious in hindsight because it's so much related to my research. My research is very much oriented around cancer therapeutics. So when I heard about this book, which is about cancer, I was like, meh, I don't know that I really need to read it. I read a lot of papers, I've taken cancer biology classes. I'm not really sure what a book will give me. So the book that I'm talking about is The Emperor of All Maladies by Siddhartha Mukherjee. The subtitle of this book is it's a biography of cancer. It's, it's basically this huge history of cancer. And Siddhartha Mukherjee is a physician who treats cancer patients, so he really has a lot of kind of hands-on experience with cancer. 
I ended up reading this book for a book club and I ended up completely amazed by it. The amount of history covers uh, he covers is incredible. He covers things from before like the papers that I've read even existed. So there's a lot for me to learn. There's also a lot of information about how the fundraisers and cancer societies that we know of today kind of came up came about um, as well as a lot of personal stories that from his own patients and the treatments that he's been a part of um, how how their their own stories with cancer are related to this like long history of this disease and I read this book during my third year of my PhD which I think is probably regarded as one of the worst years of almost every PhD. I don't know what it is about third year, but it's, for some reason it's this year where your research always feels like it's not going anywhere, experiments are failing all the time, you recognize that no matter what, how amazing our project is, it's probably not going to amount to much. It's just this weirdly bleak year for a lot of students. And this, I read this book at the perfect time, like I was really kind of in the depths of my third year angst. And what it really helped me do was put a lot of that into perspective. When you read this history of this book, you realize how, how much people got wrong and how much people got right and how these things really built on each other to get to where we are with cancer, with our cancer knowledge and treatments today and how we're still learning more. And I think what kind of the, if there's kind of an underlying theme to this, it's that the progress in science isn't made in huge leaps and bounds. It's actually made in small incremental steps that build on each other to build a picture of how the world works and how we can hopefully make it work for us. There's so much that we've gotten wrong about cancer, but just having the data, even for those incorrect conclusions, have actually helped build a bigger picture that has ultimately more correct conclusions about how this disease works and how we can potentially treat it. So I think for me at the, time, at the time that I was reading this, what it reminded me is that even if the project that I'm working on doesn't work, or even if it works and doesn't go anywhere, it's kind of still part of this like grand tradition of science that is important. Like, no, maybe no one's going to know my name, but I'm still part of this process that's really exciting and really awesome. So over the past few months, I have gotten back more into the habit of reading thanks to things like the library and podcasts and other internet things that help me find new books to read. So I'm really excited to kind of see how other forms of reading for fun will help me out and hopefully make me better in whatever it is I end up doing in the future. Like I said in the beginning, I will be making another video that's centered more on um, how writing for fun has helped me. This will actually be centered really heavily around fan fiction, so if that's something you're curious about, uh, definitely watch that one when I post it. So. Bye.